John, we're standing by one of the, the several artificial surfaces you've got here. What's this one all about? So, as you can see behind us, we've got an artificial surface here. We've got one contained in the, the large dome behind and also uh, half a pitch worth of cage synthetics. Uh, you know, synthetics have their place with a, an operation of the size that we've got here. Uh, we need rotation, especially in the winter. Um, what we found at our old training ground, which was a lot smaller than this, it was actually seven times smaller than this place, um, we could only really give the academy 25% worth of grass usage per year based on their training times. Our ambition here is to give them 75% of time on grass, but the synthetics really come into their own when we get into the depths of winter and we're trying to maintain pitches, we're trying to maintain a standard. Um, they have their place to allow us to do that. A lot of the academy football takes place on synthetic, uh, rightly or wrongly. Um, and also we have a lot of tournaments and festivals that we need to cater for, and these are ideal for that. We have to talk about COVID. What impact does it have on looking after artificial surfaces? So for us, um, you know, especially with some of the indoor surfaces and also on the outdoor surfaces, we do now have a regime of sanitising them. So we will spray them either after a use or once a week on a programme. Um, really is about and braces protection for, uh, for our players, for our staff, for anyone that uses them. Um, so in terms of maintenance, it has sort of changed the way we have to look at what we do. Um, but all for the benefit, you know, we'd rather always be safe and sorry. The same discussions we had when we were looking at the rubber crumb infill, um, lots of discussions around the properties within those infills. Um, and for us, we always look at the data, we always follow procedure. Um, so for us, it has been a little bit different, but these are maintained really well. You know, we have sort of, a, a, they get a stiff brush once a week. Uh, they get cleaned out uh, at least once a month, if not twice a month on occasions, um, because we take it quite seriously. This is a significant capital investment for anybody, whether it's us, whether it's uh, a local club investing in something like this, you have to look after them. They still take a degree of maintenance. They still have to be tested on a yearly basis for us to ascertain our Cat 1 status as an academy. So it's really important that we maintain these just, just as well, maybe not quite as intensely as the grass natural surfaces, but uh, it's certainly an important part of our maintenance schedule. And that maintenance schedule, does it differ from the indoor pitch in the dome there to the outdoor ones? No, it's exactly the same. The only difference is, is we probably get a little bit more debris out here because, you know, you might get a bit of uh, foliage from the trees or some sap or some other bits floating onto it. But indoor, it's quite contained. Um, but, you know, exactly the same sort of maintenance schedule, exactly the same, uh, you know, outlook as we do for both of them, really. Well, John, we're in your shed now. Um, some shed, firstly. <laughs> um, I know from a fact that every shed I've ever bought has filled up to the gunnels within a week and yep. not been as big as, as you need. Um, when you approached this, yep. did you have a hand in deciding what you wanted and getting it right? Yeah, so we were quite instrumental. I mean, fortunately for me, I was involved in the process literally from acquiring the land right through to building the designs and all the rest of it. So I remember quite specifically myself and my number two, Callum, were on a train down to the architects in London. Um, and we already had a really sort of good grasp of what we were going to buy. Um, and subsequently with that, we'd measured it all out. Um, so we actually had the measurements of, you know, mowers, of tractors, of, of anything that was coming into the shed, basically. And we mapped it out in the shed. And then we based our desires in terms of square meterage on that. So, okay. yeah, it was, it was quite well thought of. But actually, like you say, as, as we've moved in um, with sort of 16 utility vehicles, four tractors, you know, some of the big equipment does actually have to stay outside. Um, but for everything that needs to be inside, the space for it, as it stands, I don't think the FD would welcome any more investment in, in equipment, as it's that, you know, because we have had quite a significant uh, investment made in us. Um, but as we move forward in the future, I'm sure that we'll need to get bigger. Um, behind us, we have lots of storage bays as well for our sort of consumable materials that come in. Um, but it was as best it can be mapped out, um, and we're, we're doing all right so far. But I can't say that's not subject to change in the future. So, so that tendering process, once you got to that, yeah. Did you go through kind of like whittling down a shortlist and, and who else did you involve in that? So, yeah, we invited a lot of different manufacturers. So for mowers, we had, had, we had Baroness, John Deere, Toro. Um, we looked at um, different cylinder mowers with Dennis, we had Finnicut, we had Hondas, we had big rotaries, small rotaries, um, sprayers. We looked at the GPS spraying systems. We looked at the Toro spraying system, which we had. Um, and we tried to make it as open and as fair as possible because not every one manufacturer can do every single piece of equipment. So there was always going to be a slight blend to, to what we had. Um, but I believe that through that process, everyone got a fair opportunity to come in, present their best foot forward. 
Um, and ultimately, as most people will know, often the choice is are you green or red. <laughs> yeah. That is pretty much the choice in the industry. Um, but behind that, we've got the yellow in, in our uh, Infinicus, of which there are a lot of them. Um, and we've got some different sprayers and other, some micro sprayers and obviously the pro cores. Uh, but predominantly, it is John Deere. And decision was yours ultimately. How did you reach that decision? Did you make it in complete isolation or did you involve you know, your team in it? It was, it was a team decision, you know, from that initial stage of trialling and testing the equipment, um, then on to working with the procurement team who are very financially and number driven um, and all about the commercials. We then sort of shortlisted down to green or red and a sort of from a manufacturer point of view, but also from a supplier point of view. We had Farrells and Resync sort of coming to the fore. I then involved directors at the club. So we had the commercial director, the finance director, operations director, myself, and my number two, who had been heavily involved in the tender process as well, formalizing all of the paperwork that goes with it. Um, and each one of them presented some added value to us in terms of creating that working partnership. Um, and overall, Farrells and John Deere sort of come head and shoulders above others. Um, which didn't sort of seal the deal, but at the point where we were in the tender process, where quite even Stevens, that just nudged it for them. So uh, yeah, it was an uh, interesting process. Let's touch on staffing up. Yeah. yeah. So from six to fifty plus, mm -hmm. that's a huge, huge step, not just for the club, but for you as a manager. Yeah. How have you coped with that? Serious investment from the club first and foremost, um, you know, and faith in us. But as anything that we do here, um, there's always a process. Uh, myself and my number two, Callum um, Alsop, who, who sort of manages this site with me, um, we mapped it out to the nth degree. We looked at the holiday days, we looked at tri loo time, we looked at how many staff we'd need at any one point on pitches, on landscaping, on the golf course, in the machinery store, and tried to, on paper, which is quite difficult until you become operational, map it out so that we were trying to keep the balances at net zero for loo hours, we were trying to make sure everyone could get the holidays in. Yeah. And that sort of started to drive the numbers so that when we presented that case to the, the board um, and the FD who sort of the initial sort of <gasps> intake of <laughs> breath to say, look, you're going to 52 staff, that's a lot of people. But yeah. because we've gone through the process of mapping that out, actually they seen the vision. And now we're in here, now we're operational. Um, we're seeing that that is working, but there may still be some work to do. There may be some increases, there may be some adjustments to the way we work to make that more efficient. Um, but so far, so good. It's been working. And it, it's, it's been tricky because the personalities are different, and that's fine. And, you know, but blending those people. Um, and we have a bit of a recruitment process here where we recruit will over skill sometimes. Yeah. So we'll always want people to be willing to learn, willing to adapt um, willing to be part of something um, versus someone who may be highly, highly trained and highly skilled that actually wouldn't fit the model of what we're trying to create here, the culture we're trying to create. Um, so it's been a real challenge for myself and my immediate management team to manage that recruitment process. One that's been really enjoyable and now that it's actually in operation, seeing people work together and seeing people get on and you know, you're part of the WhatsApp groups when you see all the, the banter flying around. And actually, we've got such a great group of people here. And I say that a lot to, to people that I talk to. You know, people are your most valuable asset. We look at all these physical assets in here. They are absolutely useless if they haven't got good people sat on them. Yeah. So for me, it's really important that people are prioritized. They're looked after. Um, the club go quite a long way to do that, which I'm really grateful for. Um, and we think that we can then give them the environment to thrive and to be the best version of themselves they can be. And is the, the long-term ambition that with the academy you're going to kind of develop your own as football clubs look to do with players? Exactly. And, you know, for us with the Sports Turf Academy, it's about sort of teaching our own staff. It's a, it's a great facility to bring our own staff on and make them the best that they can be in the environment that we've given them. Um, but also bring that new talent in, inspire them and then feed the industry with good people. That's... For me, I believe there's a shortfall in that. Um, I think it's been quite widely um, publicised recently that the trade needs help. Um, and we believe that we can do that. We can inspire a generation of people that want to go out and do this as a, a full-time profession. But you're going to come here and you're going to learn how to do it, hopefully the right way. We'll still make some mistakes, of course we will. Um, but it's there to inspire a generation and feed this industry with good people and the next generation who will hopefully be in positions like mine in the future. 
So the position you're in now, yeah. and I'm going to go back to the six to 52 bit, John. Yeah. What impact has that had on you as a, as a manager? What have you had to do to get prepared for that? And what help did you get? So for me, I'm really fortunate. Um, I've got a great immediate management team um, because, you know, what I've learned as someone who has to try and lead a department of this size is that you can't be everything to everyone. You can't be everywhere. So what you have to do is put your trust in people. You have to um, excite people and inspire people to be better and to give them responsibility, enable them to do that, um, and not micromanage them or keep them under the thumb. Um, so assembling that team was probably the most critical part of us developing. Um, and we did that really quickly. And that management team's now been in place for, for a number of years all bar golf course coming online. Yeah. Um, you know, we built that team relatively early because then I wanted to enable them and empower them to build their teams too, um, which ultimately I'm sort of where the book stops. You know, I know that, but equally these guys, I can't man manage every single person throughout the club. And that's where I look to my sort of immediate management team to do that on my behalf. I create the culture, the strategy, the belief. I enable people to do their jobs by getting securing investment, um, and I'll also get involved in now cutting the pitch when I can. You know, which is it's actually now quite a nice uh, treat when I can get out and, and do something on a pitch. But you know, that my role has evolved so much, and uh, I'm so grateful to the team around me that have helped support that. And I hope in turn they feel that they've been supported by me and sort of fulfilling their ambitions and being empowered to make decisions and feel valued and part of something that's let's be honest really really special certainly i've been told by more than one head grounds but the only piece they now get is if they go off and get on a mower and escape so um there is one other thing i'll ask you while we're in in the shed here we, we touched on new skills you obviously having to pick up i guess a bit more understanding of what goes on with golf yeah, yeah? what else have you had to put into your portfolio or your repertoire with a, an estate like this and we call it an estate yeah yeah, and it, and it is because it's so diverse. Um, obviously, like you said there, the golf has come online and you know we've had to recruit really strongly in, in a course manager's position who can sort of help me along and, and sort of educate me into sort of the differences between golf and football. But equally what we've done is we've sort of helped them to look to work to a different way that maybe there's an expectation in football so that the, the two marry and the two worlds collide. Um, but on a site like this, you know, we have a lot of ecological habitat. So I'm now a license holder <laughs> for, you know, and basically that means that, you know, we're protecting the environment that we're in. Um, there's lots of strict planning conditions around us protecting that environment. It's sort of enabling and enhancing wildlife areas. Um, we've got new habitats aplenty around the site. We've got attenuation ponds. Um, we've got sort of areas of ecological interest, which we have to be so careful to manage. Um, and a lot of people can often see this as a bit of a token, but for us, we take it really, really seriously. Um, one, because of the planning obligations, but two, because it's the right thing to do. So you become almost like an ecologist as well, um, as well as someone that understands planning regulations, as well as someone that is a project manager, a, a, a greenkeeper, a groundsman, a, you know, it's just so many skills wrapped into one thing. But like I said earlier, with the team around me, you know, they are like wholly and truly the experts in their field. Um, and I'm there to support that mechanism and, and make sure that they can do their job properly. Well, this is a first for me, John. Football training ground, golf course, yeah. nine hole. Mm -hmm. Tell me. Yeah, well, uh, obviously, so when we bought the site originally, it was an 18 hole golf course um, in basically in the shape of a tee. Uh, we've developed football through the middle and now we've got an east and a west wing of golf. Um, so east, this is the east side that we're sat on at the minute, the fourth hole. Um, and this is a fully constructed green, which we, we built from scratch. Um, one of the only greens that we've really built from scratch, the rest of them were the ones that belonged to the, to the old golf course. Wall-to-wall um, -wall irrigation, so tee to green, fully, ir fully irrigated, team of four greenkeepers managing all nine holes. Um, a healthy budget, you know, we didn't want this to be a gimmick, we wanted it to be a proper course that we've got a few serious golf players in the ranks and in the first team and through the management team. Um, so we wanted to give them something that was, was of a standard that they'd be used to playing. So here we are, fast forward, sort of, we've been here, you know, working on the golf course now for about 14 months. 
Um, all the greens have been grown in from scratch, all the tees have been grown in from scratch, fairways have been renovated um, and we're starting to develop the course a little bit now. We've done some more tree planting, we're growing the rough out. Um, so learning all these terminology that you know typically I hadn't been involved with. I, I played golf a little bit when I was younger. Um, I'm by no stretch a greenkeeper, um, but we've got a really great greenkeeping team here. Uh, great course manager, uh, his assistant and two apprentices. Um, which really look after the course to the, to the nth degree, which uh, we're very happy with. Do you think you're going to take anything from this experience that will go over to the football side of things? Yeah, I mean, inherently in golf, there's always this aspiration to reduce your inputs and still produce results. Um, we're working on a theory of that with one of our trial and research um, projects this year, just to see if we can ascertain the same aesthetics that we desire and unfortunately or fortunately football is surrounded by aesthetics and it's about what people see um, but reduce those inputs to try and sort of bring down our fertilizer bill and bring down our end inputs but yeah that sort of has been something that's been interesting for me to see um, the fine turf management side of what we're doing um, the attention to detail but all things that we actually do do in football but what it does is it also gives our ground staff and football staff garden staff the opportunity to do something a bit different you know if the guys want to come and do a bit of fairway mowing or green keeping working on the greens our greens team are really sort of accommodating to that and likewise we are for the green keeping team to come and work with the football guys to get that experience and we've seen that a few times already where we've all had to muck in and, and help each other so is this really just all about trying to sign gareth bale <laughs> yeah, well, i guess we would take him if he was if he was open to playing nine holes every day but uh, we've got rooms on site for the players day rooms and hotel rooms as, as we call them for the players and uh, this is just a nice little jewel in the crown as I call it that they can come and play a really nice course if they're staying here for the evening ahead of a game the next day or even if they're here after a game. Um, some of the players do travel from quite a distance so again they'll stay here maybe the night before. The opportunity to play on a, a nice golf course that isn't just an afterthought um, was something that we thought was really important. In privacy as well, I guess. Yeah, in privacy, you know, where we are in this setting, we are a, a million miles from anything and anyone really, which is completely different to our old training ground where we were landlocked by houses and residential buildings. Um, but here, you know, there's no one overlooking you. Um, we're completely surrounded by security fence and so no one can really get into sight. Um, so if the players want to do that in the privacy, you know, in their own privacy, then this is a great place for them to do it. So, John, impressive building in the background here. Um, Obviously, brand new site. What are the pitches that we've got here? More pitches, might yeah, I say. Pitches, <laughs> yeah. yeah, so so this sort of south end of the, of the training ground is, is for first team and senior academy. So behind you, we've got four first team pitches, all stitched, um, all stitched, and three of them are heated. One of them is flood lit at the minute um, because a lot of the sessions now are moving to evening sessions with the first team playing later on in the day or travelling later on but for an away game. They like to have a flood lit pitch, um, but all fully constructed and almost the same specification as the stadium will be. Um, and then the Senior Academy, which is our 18s and 23s, this is our, their training pitches behind us, all five are sand construction. Um, again, there was the, the commercial discussions around stitching everything, which would have yeah. been great. Um, but actually, you know, five percent sand solution here was more than adequate. The first team have got a stitch solution. And then our Academy, which where we were earlier, um, they're all constructed but have a root zone top because obviously the landing foot, which gives you this, you know, which is why you need the stability, um, is not required when they're nine years old, but when they're fully grown adults and, and sort of really put some force through their feet, that's why we reinforce these pitches. You've seen this turn from literally a mud bath, you were telling me earlier, to this kind of impressive thing behind us. Yeah. What's the emotional roller coaster you've been on with through that? It was emotional in the sense of that at various different points, we didn't know whether or when we were going to be finished. It was delayed and then it, we were in, we were out, we weren't starting, we were starting. Um, so it has been a proper emotional roller coaster. And like I said, I've been so fortunate to be involved from acquiring the land right through to building the designs and through to completion. Um, it's, it was emotional at, at all stages, but we never really got that sort of ta-da moment that we're here and yeah, finally, and you can have a breathe a big sigh of relief. It was sort of from that emotion of trying to get it finished into then we've got to maintain it because the first team are here in 12 hours, you know, yeah. so it's, um, yeah, it's been a roller coaster of emotions, but we're here now, you know, the site isn't where I want it to be. I, I think in over the course of the next sort of three to five years, we're really going to develop a lot of the areas that, that we've got um, to enhance it, to, to put it onto the next level. Um, but we're really happy where we are from where we were sort of, you know, in December and we'll continue to grow and develop as we always will. So, 
a training pitch or is it an aircraft hangar? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a bit of both, I think. Yeah, we, um, this is quite an impressive structure in terms of uh, as you come into the to the site, you'll see it's one of the first things you see. Um, fully covered, full size pitch, 105 by 68, with three metre runoffs all the way around. And in terms of the actual carpet that you got down, what did you choose? So it's Lano carpet, uh, Lano carpet uh, with a rubber infill, uh, shot pad underneath, tarmac base, pretty standard, standard stuff really. Um, but again, uh, FIFA Quality Pro uh, standard that has to be for our Cat 1 audit. So uh, same maintenance schedule as the outdoor synthetics, uh, taking that really seriously because again, these are often used really heavily. So the maintenance has to be quite intense on them. Um, but yeah, it, we, if we want to encourage people to use them when we ask them to, we've got to keep them in good condition and uh, yeah, in here. It's a little bit easier because like we said earlier, there's not so much flying around, it's enclosed, um, but still has its own issues, you know, with nuts falling off the roof <laughs> and such like.